Thanks very much. Uh, and thanks very much to the organizers for uh, inviting me here. I always enjoy visiting Italy, though I've never been to this part before. Um, it's nice. So, OK, so let me start out by uh, talking about uh, relatively hyperbolic Dane filling. And we'll use that to kind of introduce some of the objects that I'm going to talk about. Um, maybe before I start writing, uh, I'll just say the Cannon conjecture is, is not, on the face of it, anything to do with Dane filling. It's about hyperbolic groups with a two-sphere boundary. And you all know examples of hyperbolic groups with a two-sphere boundary, fundamental groups of closed hyperbolic three-manifolds. And the Cannon conjecture says that's it. OK, so all right. You can make a version of that, as I said in the abstract, for, for relatively hyperbolic groups. And so uh, part of what I'm going to say is about what, what those are uh, and how you might connect uh, the two families of groups. So we'll start with um, classical uh, hyperbolic Uh, Dane filling. So this is this is this um, idea of Thurston. So you start uh, with uh, M uh, hyperbolic uh, orientable uh, finite volume. Uh, with some cusps. So, for example, you just might think about S3 uh, minus the figure eight knot, which I don't know if I can draw it quite as fast as Ian did, but there you go. So the picture you have is, of course, not of this. You're thinking about the complement. The geometry is there's some sort of fat topology in the middle, and then uh, there's these cusps. So it's something like a hyperbolic surface. So, except the cusps uh, have a torus cross section instead of, uh, instead of a circle. They go on to, you know, to infinity. So there's some cusps. So cusps uh, C, so that's the red stuff. Uh, and now, Maybe I don't like non-compact manifolds, so I can drill out the cusps, I can cut out the cusps, and I can glue in some solid tori. So, uh, so we can choose uh, uh, curves on uh, boundary of M, sort of one for each di. So this is maybe this is C1, C2, C3. Uh, and then we're going to uh, so attach uh, solid tori to uh, M minus C. Uh, so the meridians are glued to the chosen curves. So let's call them gamma 1. Gamma n. So the theorem, so surgery theorem of Thurston says that uh, for most choices of the most choices of these gamma i's, I get a closed hyperbolic manifold. And most, you can, you can be very uh, quantitative about what that means. In both of the situations, before I did the filling and after I did the filling, there was a natural kind of boundary at infinity associated. And in both cases, weirdly enough, it was a two-sphere. So, um, so call, this, call the closed manifold uh, M of gamma 1 up through uh, gamma n. And let's call, um, let's write just G for uh, pi 1 of M uh, and G bar for pi 1 of 
this thing, which is really uh, G mod out by the normal closure of the gamma i's. So, and G has some peripheral structure, P, uh, which is the set of the fundamental groups of the cusps. So purely from group theory, uh, we can reconstruct a sort of boundary at infinity. So this group G bar acts in a nice way on hyperbolic space, and therefore on the boundary, and so does G. But G acts in a little bit more particular way, in that these groups in P are fixing points at, at infinity. So they're bigger than the kind of groups that you would see fixing a point uh, at infinity of a hyperbolic group. So, um, so both have a boundary at infinity, which can be constructed from group, can be recovered from group theory. This group G bar is an example of a hyperbolic group. And this pair here, this is an example of a hyperbolic group pair, or a relatively hyperbolic pair. So other examples, and I'll just say examples rather than really give definitions. So are, if I have any kind of geometrically finite, uh, if I have gamma equal to a geometrically finite uh, Kleinian group, and here I mean of any dimension. So maybe I'll put Kleinian in quotes. I don't really necessarily mean a subgroup of PSL2C. Uh, so just in SO and one, uh, and if I take P to be a, a collection of maximal parabolics, you know, up to conjugacy, uh, then I get a, then I get an example of a pair. is a is relatively hyperbolic group pair. And if this uh, set of maximal parabolics is empty, then it's just a hyperbolic group. Uh, and these these are examples. And the questions I'm going to talk about are. I think open even for that class of groups, just discrete subgroups of SON1. So the canon conjecture uh, says that if G is a hyperbolic group uh, with two sphere boundary, then this implies that G is, and here really I mean, after killing a finite normal subgroup and maybe passing to a finite index subgroup. So it's virtually Kleinian. So it's virtually a hyperbolic three manifold group, closed hyperbolic three manifold group. So what I'm gonna call the relative canon conjecture today uh, is that there are many ways you can kind of relativize the canon conjecture, but what I want to talk about today is where you take uh, GP to be a relatively hyperbolic pair uh, where the uh, elements of P are abelian subgroups. So in general, for a relatively hyperbolic group, there's no requirement that these subgroups be anything at all. So they could be quite wild groups. But today I want to focus on abelian parabolics. So let's say I have uh, GP uh, relatively hyperbolic. Well, there's a nice proper space that you can associate to any relatively hyperbolic pair. Uh, and it has a Gromov boundary. And I'm going to call that the boundary of the pair, uh, GP. And suppose that it's homeomorphic to S2. And then it's the same con conclusion. So it's supposed to be that. Uh, G is uh, virtually Kleinian. Uh, 
Yes, thank you. Uh, relatively hyperbolic um, with uh, P, uh, a collection of abelian subgroups. It ends up following that they're rank two, if you assume that the boundary is a, a two sphere. So, so you could say rank two abelian subgroups if you want. Yeah, any other questions about what I said so far? So maybe I should say uh, just a word or two about um, this. I kind of said something in words, but let me say it just a little bit more. So, um, so what is uh, boundary of G P? Uh, and here the answer is what I mean is the Bowditch boundary. So uh, if I have a relatively hyperbolic group pair, then I can associate a gram of hyperbolic space to it in the following way. I start with the Cayley graph, and then I equivariantly attach uh, horribles to cosets of the peripheral groups. So. So this is equal to uh, the boundary of a space I'll just call X of GP. And what is that? So X of GP is equal to the Cayley graph uh, union um, horribles. In the case we're talking about today, where all my peripheral groups are rank two abelian, I can think about literal hyperbolic horribles and just attach them somehow to the cosets, right? In general, I need to take the Cayley graphs of the subgroups and do some kind of exponentially decaying product with a zero to infinity. And it doesn't really matter sort of the details of how I do that as long as, it, as, long as the metrics are exponentially decaying. The same way the metrics on hor horospheres are sort of exponentially decaying as you lift them up in the upper half space model. The rate of exponential decay doesn't matter. Um, all those spaces that you build that way will be quasi-isometric to one another. So that's basically a theorem of, of Groff, whose work was mentioned just the other day. OK, so that's what this boundary is. And what, what you get if you start with something like this, fundamental group of M, relative to the fundamental groups of these cusps, is you end up recovering something that's quasi-isometric to H3. So uh, one version of this was studied by Cannon and Cooper uh, some time ago, uh, showing that when they showed that um, the class of uh, hyperbolic, um, well, anyway, finite volume hyperbolic manifold groups, three manifold groups is, is, is quasi-isometrically rigid. OK. Um, okay, so, so we have this, this general, more general class here, and the idea is that, that we can relate these two classes by a generalization of this Dane filling construction. Um, we can relate hyperbolic. relatively hyperbolic groups uh, via uh, Dane filling. Let me say what I mean by that. So uh, if I have, um, so if I have G, P, a uh, relatively hyperbolic pair, this collection, by the way, is always going to be a finite collection. Uh, and if I choose uh, a family of subgroups, uh, N, so this is going to be a set of sort of Ni, which are normal in the Pi, where um, Pi is in this curly P. So then 
uh, if you look at the group, I'll write g bar uh, equal to, and we might, if we need to specify, write g of n. And what this is, this is just g mod out by the normal closure of the union of this collection n, normal closure in g. Uh, this is a Dane filling. This is a Dane filling of g. of the pair uh, G, P. That's the definition. And you see that it kind of generalizes the group theoretic side of what was going on here, because each of these gamma i's, so here I killed elements and not subgroups, but it's the same, same difference, right? So in each of these cases, I'm killing a cyclic group, which is generated by the gamma, gamma i. Right? All right, and there's a group theoretic uh, Dane filling theorem, which is analogous to this theorem of Thurston. In the form I'm going to state it, it's due to uh, Dennis Ozen. HDF theorem. Uh, there are weaker versions by uh, me and Groves and much stronger versions by uh, Damani uh, Giradel and Ozen. Um, but so what I want to say here is that uh, so for any, um, oh, let me make another definition here. We can let uh, P bar be the set of images so image of uh, pi mod ni in uh, g bar, right? So, um, so we suppose g p is relatively hyperbolic, uh, and then there is a bad set. I don't know, bad. This is sort of the set of exceptional fillings. It's a finite set. Actually, that's important. Finite, bad set B, sitting inside G, so that uh, for any uh, uh, collection N, as I just was describing, with, so this is B and G minus the identity, so any n with uh, the um, union of n missing b uh, then you have uh, a number of consequences. So one is that if, I, if you look at the pair, uh, g bar p bar is relatively hyperbolic. Uh, second uh, is that if you look at each of the elements of p bar, so the um, so the image of p i uh, is equal to is well it's naturally isomorphic to p i mod n i, and then so let me put this in a box. I don't want to quite get rid of it yet. Uh, so moreover, for any uh, finite set uh, F in G, there is a maybe bigger bad set, uh, B sub F, uh, so that if uh, I avoid that set, uh, then uh, F uh, embeds into uh, G bar. So this is saying that I can exhaust, uh, or rather I can do the opposite of exhaust. If I, if I um, as long as I choose, you know, right, so 
If I choose a big enough bad set, I can sort of get any finite uh, amount of data in G to survive. Now, what does it have to do with the surgery theorem? Why is this a kind of generalization of the surgery theorem? Well, the main point is something I haven't mentioned yet, which is that if you have a relatively hyperbolic group pair uh, where the peripheral groups are themselves hyperbolic, then the G bar is going to be hyperbolic as well. So maybe I'll just write that here. So if I have G comma P relatively hyperbolic and all P and curly P are hyperbolic, for instance, virtually cyclic, then uh, G is also hyperbolic. And so what's happening in the original Dane surgery theorem is that the P, P mod Ns are all cyclic groups. And so I can actually, I actually don't need them in the peripheral structure. I can discard them, get a smaller peripheral structure, in fact, an empty peripheral structure, with respect to which the fundamental group of the manifold is still relatively hyperbolic, so it's actually hyperbolic, right? Okay, uh, so what? Um, the so what is, is the following. So um, what we're able to show, uh, well, first of all, let me just ask a general question, uh, which is, so in, in the classical setting, we, we have this wonderful situation where before I deign fill, my boundary is a two-sphere. After I deign fill, my boundary is a two-sphere. In general, it's not entirely clear what happens. So um, it looks like what happens is that usually things get a lot more complicated than that. Let me just pose it as a general question. So for long Dane fillings, so that when I say, when something like this happens, when there's a bad set like this, we say that the, the conclusions hold for all sufficiently long Dane fillings, right? So maybe I'll just say that, write that in, in another color. So but this means these hold for all sufficiently long And, and the same thing with this uh, F embedding in G. It's just what sufficiently long there means depends on the set F. So for long Dane fillings, uh, how is uh, the boundary of G bar related? to the boundary of GP. I'm going to write the word red here, and I'm going to explain what I mean. Well, first, I mean, you can ask it for both. So the red means reduced. So if I have a peripheral structure, I can get a new peripheral structure by throwing away all the hyperbolic groups in the peripheral structure, right? And that's a kind of a natural thing to do. Right? So bar red means bar without hyperbolic things. So uh, sort of a partial answer. So there's some examples. Really all we have is examples. Well, there's a few things that we can say, and I'll say, say some of them. So uh, the examples uh, of uh, Mosher and Segev, 
uh, and also by uh, Koji Fujiwara and myself, um, in a setting where you can actually get something which is a little bit better than hyperbolic, you can get um, a space that's, that's cap minus one that's being acted on. Uh, so these examples suggest that usually the boundary gets a lot more complicated, but it has something to do with the old boundary. So, and I don't know about this usually, but I'm gonna say it. Uh, so usually the boundary of G bar, P bar, red, say, is much more complicated. I'll say without writing down what happens in those examples. So what happens in those examples is you start with sort of the nicest possible generalization of hyperbolic three-manifold of finite volume. You talk about a hyperbolic n-manifold of finite volume, right? And now your peripheral groups are z to the n minus one. And um, in the Mosher Sagiv examples, you just kill the entire parabolic. And in the ones that I study with um, uh, Koji Fujiwara, we kill like a, a, co, a, a co rank one subgroup, right? So everything except a cyclic group. Both of those situations, your peripheral groups are now either the trivial group or a cyclic group, so you get something hyperbolic, so it makes sense to talk about the boundary. And we show that the check cohomology of the boundary, so it's, you start out with a sphere, and then you end up with something whose check cohomology is infinite dimensional in lots of dimensions. So, uh, so it's much more complicated than a sphere. So you don't usually get a sphere. Um, and maybe there's, yeah, so there's something special about this low dimension. All right. Um, OK, so here's something you can say. It's a theorem uh, with Daniel Groves. Call this theorem uh, one because I want to refer to it later. Um, which is that so this is Groves. Um, so let's just let's assume uh, let's assume from now on that uh, uh, P consists of abelian groups. It's true in more generality. But that's plenty for what we want to do today. So um, one way to say what we said is what we proved is that if, uh, and this is true in more generality, so if GP uh, has no elementary splittings, Same is true uh, for um, G bar, P bar, you know, for long fillings. So using work of Bowditch and uh, Groff, uh, this means that in particular, Uh, have it, the boundary being, uh, and this is P red, uh, well, it's, it doesn't matter. Um, okay. So if I have boundary of G P connected uh, without local cut points, uh, this implies that if I look at boundary of G bar, say P bar red, is also connected without local cut points. And the reason for that is that uh, connectedness has to do with free splittings, uh, and cut points have to do with splittings either over parabolic groups. Uh, so cut points have to do with splittings over parabolic groups, and uh, cut pairs, if you have a local cut point, you've usually got a nice cut pair that's gonna give you a cyclic splitting. So, so that's the connection between those things. So we can say a little bit about the topology at infinity. No, it's not a three-dimensional statement. This is just a statement in general. <laughs> 
Yeah, an abelian is much stronger than what we need for the... So to get the statements about the boundary, we do need some assumptions because these theorems of Bowditch and Graf that we're applying require... Um, um, yeah, and I'm being a little bit sloppy about what I'm saying, too. Anyway, you, uh, you, can, you can ask me about particulars later if you have a particular example you, you care about. All right. Um, oh, right. So what I want to talk about... Uh, right, so now I've introduced what I'm talking about. Um, and let me just say the two kind of main statements I want to talk about today. So, uh, so the theorem A uh, is um, that, well, okay, so I'll just state the one that's in the abstract first. So it says that if the, uh, the, the canon conjecture implies uh, the relative canon conjecture. So maybe you think the canon conjecture is false. Um, but you should still be happy about this theorem, right? Because it means that it's easier to find a counterexample. Because <laughs> you can go to this world of relatively hyperbolic groups. Okay, but there's, this comes from an absolute theorem that doesn't have to do with relating different conjectures. So that's theorem B. Which says that, um, so if you have, uh, so let's say we have G, P, uh, a relatively hyperbolic pair uh, with, um, boundary equal to the two-sphere, and uh, P consisting of abelian subgroups. I would guess this isn't necessary. Um, but, well, I'm just going to write down what we proved, what it occurred to me I could prove this week, maybe. Um, so if this is true, uh, then uh, for all sufficiently long uh, classical fillings, okay, what's a classical filling? I'll tell you that in just a second, but it's something analogous to what happened for a hyperbolic three-manifold. Uh, then the uh, boundary of G bar, well, first of all, G bar is a hyperbolic group, so I can just talk about the boundary of G bar. Um, and what you'd like to say is, so a classical filling is where you kill an infinite cyclic subgroup of each parabolic, right? And so what you want to say, and what would be true if, they, if, if, this, if we started with a Kleinian group, is that the boundary of the result would be a two-sphere all the time, right? So we don't know that, but we can show it's either a two-sphere or a Sapinski carpet. And that's good enough, it turns out, to get theorem A. So, um, maybe just, yeah, I'll just write this. So, classical, this means that uh, each. Uh, Ni is, uh, so I'm either doing a, if it was a three manifold, I'd either be doing an ordinary Dane filling or an orbifold Dane filling. Um, any questions before I 
talk about why theorem B implies theorem A. Yeah. No, no. If the relative, well, it's not compatible. Yeah, that's right. It's not. So if either, if the conjecture is true, then you you actually never get the Sierpinski carpet. That's right. Yeah. So I mean, I, I should say, like, how do Sierpinski carpet uh, boundaries appear in nature um, and not in imaginary counterexample land? Uh, so if you take a hyperbolic three manifold with totally geodesic boundary and no parabolics, right, no cusps, and look at its limit set, it's going to be a Sapinski carpet, right? So the, the, the elevations of the boundary components are giving you these hyperbolic planes and the whole limit set's on one side of each of those. So you're getting S2 minus a bunch of, bunch of disjoint disks, disks with disjoint closures, I should say. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure. You, you could conjecture it in general. I mean, there, there's, I don't know any counterexamples. In the theorem, uh, yes. In the theorem, I mean this version with P a collection of abelian subgroups, yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, So the Sierpinski carpet situation, uh, so we have to deal with that somehow, right? So if I've got my filling, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a bunch of Kleinian groups. If it's all S2, then I just automatically get my quotients being a bunch of Kleinian groups from canon conjecture. But in fact, I also get that for Sierpinski carpet boundary too, and that's by a theorem of Kapovich and Kleiner. So, that uh, uh, the canon conjecture uh, implies that, um, let me use maybe a different letter, uh, any mm, hyperbolic uh, gamma with boundary of gamma, a Sierpinski carpet, is, you know, virtually Kleinian. So for now, let's just ignore all the virtually stuff, so, which, you, which you can. Uh, so for the purposes of explaining something, so ignore virtually. And start with your relatively hyperbolic group pair. So, so we assume that I have a relatively hyperbolic group pair uh, with boundary S2. Uh, and now choose a kind of co-final sequence of classical fillings. So, Uh, GI bar, right? So what do I mean co-final? I just mean that um, if I look at any, you know, if I look at any finite set, then it's going to embed in all but finitely many of these things. So uh, the intersection of the kernels is, is trivial. And so uh, Kapovich and Kleiner, together with the canon conjecture, so CC plus KK uh, implies that for each of these, uh, you, get, you get an embedding, you're forgetting the virtually, into uh, SL2C. So, bar embeds in PSL2C discreetly. So now I can think of each of these as uh, a representation of the original G, and so I get a sequence of points on the character variety of G, sequence of rep, uh, representing representations, uh, a stably faithful 
a sequence of representations. So, row i of g PSL to C uh, discrete and stably faithful. And now, if I think about the characters, well, there's either convergent subsequence or there isn't. If there's a convergent subsequence, well, then they're going to converge to a representation of G that is faithful, but you can also show is discrete. So I guess maybe it's not. You prove them both at the same time. So we can show uh, that if uh, the chi i converge to chi infinity, then chi infinity is discrete faithful. And I get to stop. So if, on the other hand, the characters diverge, uh, then I'm getting this, uh, because they're stably faithful uh, and they're diverging, well, some traces are going to infinity. So I mean, well, I guess that's what I mean by diverge. Anyway, you can rescale the action on hyperbolic space. Uh, and in the limit, so this is a kind of standard technique in geometric group theory. In the limit, you get uh, an action on an R tree. And you can show that that's a stable action uh, with abelian arc stabilizers. So otherwise, uh, the chi i converge to a stable action on an R tree uh, with uh, abelian arc stabilizers. Okay, and then we apply the RIPS machine, uh, which implies that um, the original group G uh, has uh, a splitting over an abelian group, and so that's going to have to be um, uh, an elementary splitting. I can think of a GP has an elementary splitting, which implies that um, the boundary of GP wasn't a two-sphere. Because it would have to either be disconnected or have a local cut point, right? which S2 doesn't. All right, so that last part, of course, is using uh, here. Well, no, it's well, no, it's not. It's just using what I just said. Sorry. Okay. Um, we, another way to think, to think of it is that you have a contradiction to uh, the statement that. Uh, actually, sorry, I'm just I'm tying myself in knots here. Let me not say any, any more about that. And let me move on to the next, to, prove, to, the, to sketching theorem B. Okay. So the idea here is that we want to use, um, so we're going to use a criterion of Claytor uh, to show that the boundary of, of a long filling is planar, right? And so we're allowed to use Claytor's criterion because we already know that the boundary doesn't have any local cut points. So, um, so the theorem one. Uh, so, uh, 
uh, implies that uh, if I look at, so from now on, G bar um, is just going to be some very long filling. Uh, no cut points. So there's a theorem of Claytor says that uh, piano continuum without cut points uh, planar uh, if and only if uh, it contains no topolo obvious topological obstruction of being planar. So, so it's the analog of Kurotowski's theorem. It's the same as Kurotowski's theorem. It's just that you're allowing a continuum and not just a graph. So, um, what, so we want to. So we need to try to show. Uh, that no such graph, right? So no K5 or K33 embeds. And how do we do that? Well, we need some way of approximating the boundary. Um, idea uh, is we're going to approximate uh, boundary of G bar uh, by a um, partly truncated uh, Quotient, well, I'm sorry, by the boundary of a partly truncated quotient of, of the space, uh, the model space for GP. Boundary of the ZN spaces where uh, ZN is a uh, partly truncated. quotient of x of gp by a finitely generated free factor of the kernel of the map from g to g bar. So it's a result of Damani Girdon Ozen that for long fillings, the kernel of the map from G to G bar is freely generated by some collection of intersections with parabolics, right? And so um, the way that's proved, they sort of like, they, they get an exhaustion of it by sort of infinitely many factors at a time. And that kind of doesn't work for our argument because we want, we want finitely generated free factors. So we kind of give a new uh, argument uh, for that same theorem. But um, so we just point that out. So DGO says that this kernel, let's call it K, bar again for a sufficiently long filling, uh, and in this case it's a classical filling, so it's a free pro free product of cyclic groups. So it's uh, freely generated. by certain parabolics. So uh, we give another description, which is, which is basically the same, so um, except sort of filtering it more slowly. Exhaustion of K uh, by uh, finitely generated uh, quasi-convex, of course not uniformly quasi-convex, uh, 
free subgroups, so free factors. Well, I'll call them sort of F sub N. Uh, and so the idea is that, so F sub N, let me just draw kind of picture here, one dimension down. Uh, so this is a sort of picture of H2. Uh, and so I've got, um, say, two. If I look at the subgroup of my filling kernel that's generated by, say, parabolics fixing just two of the points. So I can sort of delete horribles around those points, but leave alone the rest of the points. And now look at. Um, So, so the elements of the kernel are sort of moving everything very, very far along these horospheres. So, so my uh, element fixing this uh, point at infinity is going to send this maybe to, to this over here. Really, they're going to be so vanishingly small you can't see them. But I want to draw them a little bit visible. So this is going to get identified to this. And so what we sort of end up with is... Uh, this um, picture like this. Let me, let me just draw it flat. So if you think about what the quotient there is, I've got this sort of um, fundamental domain for it in the middle. sort of the orange part sort of goes out to infinity. OK. Another way you can think, if I didn't delete the horror balls, it would be I just sort of attach a couple of horns to this picture, right? Sort of going down, these cusps going down. Now, this space is not simply connected, but it is delta hyperbolic. Uh, and by choosing the depths of these horror balls carefully, we can show that these spaces are uniformly delta hyperbolic. So I have these uniformly delta hyperbolic spaces where I've sort of taken the boundary of the original space and quotient it out by bigger and bigger subgroups of the kernel K. And it's these spaces, those quotients, are, which are going to be uh, the approximations for the final boundary. So, so that's what I mean here by a partly truncated quotient of X by this finitely generated free group. So, so we show uh, that the boundaries of these ZNs uh, converge, in some sense, uh, to uh, the boundary of G bar. And in fact, we need to be a little bit, we need to have a fairly strong statement. So, uh, so we show, in particular, uh, there are uh, visual metrics on these spaces uh, so that um, so and uh, sort of uh, k well not k uh, lambda uh, epsilon sub n quasi isometries from boundary of z n the boundary of G bar with uh, lambda fixed and epsilon n going to zero. So they're sort of, we can't make them isometries, but they get closer and closer to kind of by Lipschitz maps, right? And under these conditions, so we, uh, so there's an argument of Ivanov. Oh, right. Uh, moreover, uh, we show that these things are spheres. So that's sort of obvious in this example, that I get a one sphere at infinity. But in general, in fact, we also get, we get two spheres in our setting. So also, uh, the boundary of Zn are spheres with uniformly linearly connected metrics. 
I didn't know what that meant before I started this project. Okay, I'm going up because I'm getting near the bad part. All right, so let me just say one more sentence and then I'll, and then I'll stop. Um, so the final thing that we do is that we apply this argument of Ivanov, which was used in a different context, uh, uh, which shows that under these circumstances, he had some slightly different circumstances, but the argument still goes through, uh, that any graph that I could embed in this boundary, I can embed in all but finitely many of these boundaries. So, uh, so if a graph embeds in boundary of G bar, it embeds in um, all but finitely many boundary of ZNs. All right, so this gets us that, uh, using Claytor's criterion, this gets us that the boundary of G bar is planar. And then the fact that there is no local cut point, uh, together with another theorem of Kapovich and Kleiner, gets us that, in fact, it's a, it's a Sierpinski carpet or a two-sphere, and that those are the only possibilities. And so that's the end of the argument. I'll stop.